The appeal behind Shane Dawson is the same appeal behind the composite columns in the Capitol building. Yep, that's me. You're probably wondering how I ended up in this situation. All right, hi fairies, I hope you're well. So I am filming this on the 23rd of June and it has been a crazy week. If Dramageddon 3 does leave things very shaken, I encourage you to just sit down and enjoy this video. Because in this video, we're going to be analyzing as well as applying some theories within anthropology and sociology to hopefully extract a little bit of meaning from all this. What does it mean? I'm also going to be doing my makeup at the same time because, once again, I have to make this gay somehow. Uh, oh. What she said? Queen. Also, sorry if this video is really, really late. You know, I did have to deal with two illegal copyright takedown notices from he who shall not be named. You know those videos were really well done when it pisses him off that much. He's so bothered. Anyways. So funny. It's so funny to me. Before we get into it, I want to give a shout out to Mix Easy. This isn't sponsored, but they sent me a bunch of their products and I don't want kindness to go unnoticed. Mix Easy is one of those skincare brands where you can actually mix your own custom skincare. It's really cool. It'll make an amazing birthday present. I'll leave all of their links in the description but I will be using their face cream as primer today. So for those of you that are new, welcome to internet archaeology, basically where we just explore the internet in a scholarly way. Basically these are like video essays or video dissertations. So the structure of this video is the following. First we will define religious sociology and draw connections to argue that stan culture is not actually cultural but is in fact actually more religious in nature. Also if your skin can handle fragrance, get the black currant scent, it smells so good. Like truly. Yeah. Then we will be applying applying these theories to internet celebrities and YouTubers. Then I will introduce you to my theory of internet mythology. After that, we'll then go into investigating and defining internet factionalism and the phenomenon of dramageddons. And then lastly, I will list some applications of my theories and ways you can use them just to make better and more informed decisions on the internet. After my first internet archaeology video, a lot of people say they found it super informative or it was even like life-changing. It was a cultural reset. I, I don't know about life-changing. Y'all are really sweet, but, <laughs> but a lot of people were asking me, can you do one for so-and-so? Can you do one for this person? Can you do one for this person? You know, I literally got so many requests for so many different people. It would literally be impossible for me to create 30 minute video essays for each one of these people. So I decided to make a much more broad topic in which we can just have a discussion about the mentality within stand culture. And I can pass on to you some of the logical tools you're going to need in order to potentially make your own opinions or apply these theories so you get a much more clear picture of what's going on here. So welcome to the cult mentality within stand culture. In Internet mythology. Yeah, get into it. So what is the difference between actual religion and religious thinking? So religious sociology is the study of the impact religions have on people, not the study of religions themselves. Now it is very possible for one to have a religious mindset or fall within a religious label, even without acknowledging it or belonging to a certain faith. A real world example of this is that 30 to 39 percent of the Japanese population identifies as atheist. However, when you actually look into Japanese Japanese culture, there is a very, very clear and distinct influence of Japanese Shinto. Shinto is the Japanese religion. If you watch anime, you can see this influence all the time and you probably know. But an example I'm pretty sure a lot of people will understand now is in Animal Crossing, the character of Tom Nook and Red. Tom Nook is not actually a raccoon and Red is not actually a fox. Tom Nook is actually a spirit within Shinto known as a Tanuki, a raccoon spirit. And Red is actually what's known as a Kitsune or a fox spirit. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I earned a degree. And a lot of people describe this as Japanese culture, and this is very interesting because the line between culture and religion can become very blurred very easily. Even though Japan identifies as one of the most atheist populations on the whole planet, Shinto, or a religious belief, still plays an extremely huge role in their culture and daily lives. Keeping this real world example in mind, it is actually a very documented phenomenon that it is possible for individuals to have a religious mindset or religiously wired brain, but not actually acknowledging or specifically belonging to any religious background or value. We're studying the effects and psychological nature of religion, not religion itself. I don't read the Bible, I read bitches to filth. Now come on now. Oh, I'm cursing again. My credibility out that window right there. One of the 
Now that we've established it's possible to have a religious mindset without actually acknowledging a certain religion, let's actually define what a religion is within sociology before we actually move into making comparisons on the internet. We gotta have a good base before we start making comparisons. So according to Talcott Parsons, one of the leading American sociologists, a religion is something defined by five... What was that? ...requirements. Why don't we all take a look? An integrated set of beliefs concerning entities which are supernatural, sacred, or set apart from the ordinary. Key word there, set apart from the ordinary, such as internet celebrities or YouTubers. She's got a point. Two, a system of symbols, objects, acts, and persons which have the quality of sacredness to which people express the emotional states relevant to the religious sphere. A system of symbols, objects, acts, and persons. For example, merch or inside jokes within communities. An example of this would be how within Jeffree Star's community, the Star family, the phrase can't relate is certifiable of this community. Interesting. Three, a set of prescribed activities important or obligatory, such as meet and greets, attending concerts, regularly interacting with digital content. Four, beliefs are shared and felt to constitute a collective, a shared identity and moral community. Key words there, shared identity and moral community. For example, the barbs. To freedom! Five, a sense that man's relationship to the supernatural is connected with his moral values. So basically who you stand is indirectly a reflection of who you are. And other people can judge you based on these things. For example, Ooh. if you stand or you support Donald Trump, people are likely to assume things about you. Just as if you stand or support Lady Gaga, people are likely to assume things about you. Uh, oh. My base is looking so good today. I thought I would fuck it up. Uh. So now that we've defined what a religion is, let's define why a religion, why religions form. Dyslexia. So there are three main approaches to the reason why religions form. There's the psychological approach from Spyro, the symbolic approach from Geertz, and the sociological approach from Durkheim. Now, if I'm being honest with you, when there are three theories about the same thing, especially within, you know, something not really scientifically provable, you kind of just pick the one that works best with whatever you're saying. So for this video, we're going to go with Durkheim's approach, which is the sociological one. Durkheim says that a religion forms as a unified set of beliefs and practices relative to sacred things. That is to say things set apart from the ordinary and forbidden. Beliefs and practices which unite onto one single moral community, all those who adhere to them. In this period. Once again, key word there, one single moral community. A religion or religious mindset develops as a unifying force amongst similar peoples. Under Durkheim's approach, we can say that these communities on the internet form out of worship of something similar. But now that we've defined what a religion is and why they form within the sociological perspective at least, let's begin to analyze the internet and stand culture in detail using these observations. Fuck my pussy with a rake, mom. All right, so I did my brows off camera because I, I cannot do brows. Oh! I can't focus on orientation and brows at the same time. Brows are stressful enough. Ooh. So it is extremely common within multiple different sacred narratives from multiple different cultures for the setting to occur in a location or setting outside of the normal world. Basically, a lot of sacred narratives will contain a spirit world or other world. The Danis. Such as Mount Olympus within Greek mythology or Tiranonok in Gaelic mythology. This other world will always be a place much, much different than our own world. These other worlds or spirit worlds will oftentimes be a place where humans can peer into, however they cannot directly cross into or physically enter. Yay. Now, doesn't that sound an awful lot like the internet? A place outside of our world that we can peer into, but we cannot directly enter or physically cross into. A realm that we can't see or interact with with our eyes, but with our phones, just like a crystal ball. My mind, oh, it amazes me sometimes. That is why oftentimes people will refer to the internet as a platform, implying that it is actually a place or setting. Now, the internet or our modern day spirit world is not inhabited by, by ghosts or mythical creatures, but of echoes and extensions of human consciousness. But what? Images crafted by humans, but images themselves not human. For example, the person you see on your screen right now isn't actually a person. What you're gazing upon is a collection of pixels that collectively forms an extension of my consciousness. It's a ghost or echo of this very moment. It's getting weird. Like me physically, right now when you're watching this, I could be on the toilet and you would never know. Oh. So the eyeshadow palette I'm using is the Goddess palette from Alter Ego. Now, I actually pick this because now we're going to talk about deities and gods. So the internet is embodied by images and echoes of people. However, some of these images develop a cult-like following. And my theory is that YouTubers and internet celebrities are embodiments of some ideal, whether it be musical, physical beauty, or some political virtue. Their presence on the platform is highly symbolic. Let's apply this theory to a key figure on the internet. So Nicki Minaj is oftentimes referred to as the queen of rap. 
So if we replace the words queen with goddess or patroness of, we can conclude that Nicki Minaj is the internet's goddess of rap. <laughs> Now, Nicki Minaj's community is called the Barbs. They worship the icon or symbol of Nicki Minaj. So the worshippers or cult of the internet's deity of rap music would be the Barbs, a single moral community united over a set of symbols, objects, and peoples, which is Durkheim's theory of religion. Been that bitch, steal that bitch. Let's apply this logic to another key internet figure while also elaborating on it a little bit further. Kim Kardashian is the internet's Venus. Venus. She's not really known for anything else other than physical beauty as well as the sex tape. I, I can't. <laughs> now, as I'm sure many of you know, Kim Kardashian has her own perfume brand, KKW Fragrance. One of the fragrances she sells is called KKW Body. This is how the bottle looks. Big boobs. It is a mold of her naked body. Now, to her supporters or her worshippers, this is what we would refer to as a religious fetish. Now, the word fetish has two meanings. The most common one is, you know, like feet pics and shit like that. But a religious fetish is actually an object that's value comes from a perceived mystical quality. For example, well, these are two pens. Yes. If I took these pens, threw them on the floor, and stomped on them, no one would care. But if I were to take these pens and glue them together like this, Jesus Christ. and then stomp on them, people would really care. This is a key example of a religious fetish, an object that's value does not come from its materials, but its symbolic value. I'm so creative like that. We can say that Kim Kardashian's perfume follows the same logic, as a major part of its appeal is its symbolic referencing, or perhaps even literal referencing. The perfume bottle actually bears a striking resemblance to statues of Venus herself. She's got a point. Now, if you didn't know the context behind the Venus de Milo, for example, you would say, oh, it's just a statue of a naked lady. Let's get naked! However, its symbolic meaning makes it much, much more important. It's not just a statue of a naked lady, it's a statue of Venus. I'm washing me in my clothes! Just like Kim Kardashian's perfume bottle is not just any mold of a feminine torso, it is the mold of Kim Kardashian's torso. Period. So now that we've laid out what entities populate this spirit realm of the internet and how they work, let me introduce you to my theory of internet mythology. High school fucking bully! The question you get asked a lot is people will always ask is God real is magic real and as I said at the beginning of the video that doesn't really matter for religious sociology at least regardless of whether gods the supernatural or myths are real the effects they have on people is still very real whether or not God is scientifically provable or the concept holds any scientific merit people will still act as if it is 100% true oh, excuse me thank you Jesus I and I'm not trying to attack anyone's religious values by saying that, but what I am trying to say is it's useless to try and scientifically explain something non-falsifiable. It's like trying to explain love. It just doesn't really work and the solution isn't really clean. What is love? I'm actually a virgin who's never had a boyfriend, so I honestly don't know, sis. We're not discussing the thing itself, but merely the effects it has on people. So when talking about things in the sacred realm, it doesn't matter whether or not these things actually happened. What does matter is if the story is accepted. I don't know what the she's saying but girl i am living that's the difference between major religions and cults cults are religions we don't buy they're religions whose sacred narratives we don't culturally accept um chill. anyway so whereas the major religions those are the sacred narratives we accept once again it doesn't matter if the story holds any scientific or provable merit but what matters is if people choose to accept it basically if they like the story an example of this would be the fall of troy in the iliad so the fall of troy likely did not happen because three bitchy goddesses we're fighting over a piece of fruit. Ooh, bitch, what's up? We can fight, bitch, because it's legal now. It likely happened due to pre-existing wars and political struggles. But remember, it doesn't matter if a sacred story or mythos is true. What does matter is if it's accepted. That is why within pop culture and academia, whenever you're referring to the fall of Troy, people will always bring up the Iliad or the judgment of Paris. Because the most famous account of a historical event is actually a fictional one. <laughs> Wait a damn minute. It's a fictional account of the reason why Troy fell. And at the end of the day, Troy still fell. I've fallen. An example of this we can apply to our own little internet sacred narrative would be what happened with James Charles last year during Dramageddon 2. <laughs> The allegations against him weren't actually backed by any factual evidence. We know this because of the Keemstar podcast. It's But it's people that are in our community that are saying things, and I don't know if they're true or not. Yeah. If it's so real, funny. because I don't know if it's real, and I don't know if it's real. Yikes. 
This ain't it, Chief. But the effects it had on him were still very, very real. Because if it weren't for them, I would not be alive today. And just like what I was saying about the fall of Troy earlier, you know, within the mythosphere, it doesn't matter if that actually happened. What does matter is the outcome and which story of how we got there people will believe. This is the theory of internet mythology. The theory that since the internet is a sacred realm, the things that happen on it are not always justifiable with proof. All right, so the makeup's done, but I'm gonna keep talking. Basically what I'm trying to say is the fall of James Charles is very similar to the fall of Troy. It likely didn't happen because all this, all that. But this very real event was likely caused due to pre-existing struggles between quote-unquote competitors. Just like what happened with Troy because the victor in this case got to write an extremely elaborate story about it and use this narrative to promote a certain something. Just like how the Iliad uses that very real event to propagate the Greco-Roman pantheon. Very good tea. And before I get into my next point, which is about internet factionalism and drama get -ins, a lot of people wanted me to talk about Shane for a quick second, so I'm gonna do that now. Yay, team! A lot of people wanted me to analyze the appeal behind someone like Shane Dawson and how it fits in with this theory, so I will do that right now. As I established before, people on the internet have a very mythical role within the sacred narrative. It's a very well-documented phenomenon that people will have an obsession with an origin story. You know, this mythical tale of Genesis where a modern day is the consequence. That's why all of the government buildings here in the US will always feature Greek motifs, such as composite columns and domes within their architecture. That's not just because they look pretty and grand. Mm. Very good. But it's because here in America, we are obsessed with the origin story of democracy. And we believe that the Greeks were the creators of democracy. And our obsession with that origin story is clearly visible in the architecture of our government buildings. This is crazy. When it comes to thinking about where we came from, we typically like the most extravagant and beautiful mythical option, if historic accuracy is not necessarily required. The appeal behind Shane Dawson is the same appeal behind the composite columns in the Capitol building. Cut the cameras. Shane Dawson has been on the platform ever since it was created. He is a living remnant and relic of the creation period in which the platform we know and love was formed. In those Twitter paragraphs or whatever he posted, he even referred to himself as the grandpa of YouTube. Given that his appeal lies mostly in the past and in nostalgia, as soon as you begin to see the old Shane in perhaps a new light, the appeal of new Shane almost instantly melts away. Yo man, we got a hot one right here. Girl, what the fuck is you talking about? Yikes. This ain't it, chief. But anyways, that's my analysis of that. Let's move into the next point, which is internet factionalism and an analysis of the phenomena of Dramageddon. So the beauty community is not actually one community anymore, at least within this time. And it's a common pattern and phenomenon within these past few years for multiple different factions to exist within it. The beauty community is highly factionalistic. I know this because after posting the first two Jeffrey videos in which I was very critical of him, many big names, girl, like, I don't want to spill tea, but... Let's just say they have a check mark next to their Instagram. Many of these huge names that have been previously wronged by Jeffrey were actually DMing me in support, saying that the video was amazing, saying it was excellent. They were very, very sweet, but it almost felt as if this interaction was caused out of the mentality that the enemy of my enemy is a friend. Currently, in this very moment, on June 23rd, because things are changing very fast, the beauty community is divided into two major factions. It's a strange unspoken rule where if you support the members of one faction, you can't support the members of another. When in reality, I, and I'm sure many other people, like members on both sides. Now these factions form as a result of Dramageddon's, or as I think of them, schisms. For those of you that don't know, a schism is a separation in the church. An example of this would be the Great Schism branched off from the Catholic Church and formed two different factions. Ooh, girl. Is there anything else you want? No, because I'm about to leave because I ain't got time for Do what you do. You definitely waste your time because if you thought you were going to come here and continue to mother Ain't nobody you know, yeah, Ain't nobody I just called you out on every last one of your Mom, lives. You ain't called yeah, Girl. You ain't called Ooh, Jesus, take the wheel. Show ass. Whatever. You in the that you fell on, honey. Hey, I tell you what, you gonna have to run and catch it. Whatever. Kiss the crack of my ass, bitch. Hey, you can smell mine. Everyone died. The end. Given that our worship of these people is highly religious, a Dramageddon is actually a schism, a time in which the chains that bind everything together are melted away by the heat of controversy. Hi, how are you? <laughs> Damn, this is some scary shit! 
it. When these chains are melted away, things can arrange themselves much more easily. In order for these factions to shift or change or make new factions or delete old factions, a Dramageddon has to occur because things are bound the way they are as soon as the Dramageddon ends. And as tension within and between factions continues to build, a Dramageddon is more increasingly likely. Now, releases of tension are extremely big reasons why we have a lot of holidays. Something a little bit more comparable to a Dramageddon that is also a release of tension would actually be a historic holiday known as the Feast of Fools. The Feast of Fools was a holiday celebrated during a time in which you could not say shit about the king or the pope. Like, you would be guillotined. <laughs> The Feast of Fools was a day in which pretty much people would get super drunk. It wouldn't be a human holiday if there wasn't alcohol involved. Two shots of vodka? But they would basically get super drunk and the person that was the most drunk, like falling over, stumbling, whatever, basically the person that was making the biggest fool of themselves, they would dress them up as the Pope or the King. Sometimes it would be a disabled person, but let, let, let's not talk about that. We are going to pretend we didn't hear that. You know, like, look at how silly this guy looks. It, it's really weird. It's getting weird. And they would all just get their life from this guy wearing the Pope costume, falling over, making a complete fool of himself. This is giving me life, hunty. Now, the Feast of Fools was the only day this activity was okay. Any other day of the year, if you were to mock or say anything negative about the Pope or the King, it was a much needed release of tension that came through in the form of mockery. Are these Dramageddons the same thing as the Feast of Fools, a release of tension that comes through in the form of mockery? And like I kind of said earlier, these releases of tensions are extremely necessary because if you don't have a day or specific time period where it's acceptable to vent frustrations, people are going to explode and do it when it's unacceptable and be less likely to follow certain rules. I'd also like to note that the reason why the Feast of Fools is no longer celebrated is because there's no need to. There's no more tension surrounding things like the Pope or King because you can pretty much say whatever you want about people. It's free speech, I guess. I have freedom of speech and everything I'm saying is true. Why I'm making this comparison is because if we want to solve this whole problem of internet dramageddons and all this, the toxicity of the internet, we can't blame the actual process itself. The release of this tension in one way or another is inevitable. But if we look at past examples and the way they kind of disappeared or were solved, we can see that the solution to eliminating the problem is a eliminating the source of the frustration. Which leads me into my next point, the implications and precognition we can make using these theories. Like I said, a Dramageddon is a schism. It's a time in which the heat of controversy melts the chains that bind everything together. Eloquently spoken. So if there is a change we want, a Dramageddon is the perfect time to implement a course of action to make the change. So moral of the story here is don't idolize celebrities too much because you're not actually idolizing them, you're idolizing their image. And secondly, Dramageddons provide a very valuable release of tension, not only for creators, but also for the community. It's a time in which you can vent your frustrations and release the attention while also having a say in how the community will reshape itself. This not only applies to YouTube beauty community, as factions will oftentimes form from de facto segregation, or basically condensation of like-minded things and people. And I'm not trying to say Dramageddons are going to be a thing forever, but just like the Feast of Fools, which we don't celebrate, you must eliminate the reason for the tension in order to eliminate the release or reaction to it. I can expect a copyright takedown notice on this video, but yes, that's it for this installment of Internet Archaeology. Let me know if if you want to see more of this series or if you're like, girl, this is so fucking boring. Because the purpose of internet archaeology, for me at least, is to really just give you the logical toolkit you'd need to make your own more informed decisions and just have a much more informed time on the internet. Which means, to me at least, a much more fun and honest time on the internet. Oh my god, girl, I low-key caused Dramageddon 3 just by telling people it's okay to have an opinion. <laughs> that was easy. But thank you so much for watching and I hope you learned something new. Bye. I'm done. I just went on Twitter. Imagine. 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 Not uploading apology video. Imagine not uploading a fucking apology video and speaking to your audience that pays your motherfucking bills. <laughs>